Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. Remember that all success is based on long-term commitment, faith, discipline, attitude, and a few stepping stones along the way. And that's a great quote by Jim Rohn. And my guest has had long-term success, and I will share more about this and who he is and why you want to listen to him in just a sec. Uh, <clears throat> before I do, I have a request. I First of all, I'd love for you to check out my newly updated website, Lucy Dumas coaching.com and I'd love an email or a Facebook shout out or a comment wherever you're listening to this just to let me know you're listening and what you appreciate I'm a person that my love language one of them is words of affirmation and recently I've had a few people tell me they listen on their walks or different things and it just gives me a reason to keep doing this because <laughs> this is a labor of love yes I get new clients now and then with my coaching but mostly I'm sharing and so yeah it would mean a lot if you could just take a minute and say howdy okay that being said let me tell you about the great Mark Campbell <laughs> He, his uh, bios, he wrote it pretty simply. And I think after 40 years in the biz, he probably has a much longer bio, but here's, here's the, in a nutshell. He started his career 40 years ago. He closed his studio in 2021, and he is currently the vice president of the photographers, profession, sorry, professional photographers of America. He has spoken and mentored extensively throughout the U.S. over, I'm tongue-tied tonight. <laughs> He's spoken and mentored extensively throughout the U.S. for over 20 years. He was an Adobe certified expert for a time. And so welcome, Mark. Thank you so, so much well, for being here. Thank you for having me. Show. Oh, and he's, if you're going to listen in 2024, then you need to know he's the current president of the Professional Photographers of America. But if you're listening in 2023, he's the future <laughs> president of the, the board at PPA. So yeah, and we've never officially met. So I'm super excited to learn more about Mark and to share him with you. Um, so, Mark, I would love to know just a little in a nutshell, what got you started in photography? <laughs> oh, wow. I think the story is pretty similar to a lot of people. Uh, I just always loved taking pictures. I, I remember as a kid uh, stealing my dad's little Kodak Instamatic and wandering around taking pictures and having him process the film and go, who shot this? I didn't take these, you know, <laughs> um, and then uh, getting older and, you know, getting into the workforce and having money to spend, I started to buy cameras. And, uh, you know, I had friends at the time who were building show cars and motorcycles and things like that. And, you know, so the natural request is, oh, could you take some pictures of my car? Or, and that just led one thing into another. And it wasn't until that started happening that I realized you could actually make money doing this. It had never mm -hmm. dawned on me before. Uh, I was at the time I was working in a steel mill. I was uh, working in electrical maintenance in a steel mill. H hated the job, but it was you know great money, great benefits. Those were in the days that the word copay didn't exist. You know your insurance covered everything. Yeah. So if you had a job like that, you hung on to it. But um, you know fate just had a different path, and it was drawing me more and more. Uh, towards something more creative and uh, one day I just snapped and walked away from it all and have been doing this ever since. Um, so, so when you did that did you have savings did you have a rich wife <laughs> you know uh, how did you find actually, the courage to yeah. make that change? So the, the studio had been in operation part-time for 
I want to say four years. Mm. Uh, I've done, I'd worked freelance for some other studios prior to that. And then I had my own studio for about four years, but it was part time. And my wife at the time, she's, she's my ex wife now, um, she uh, quit her job in, uh, I think it was New Year's of 1993. And the, the plan was for her to manage the studio, book the appointments, and then I would shoot evenings and weekends. And that lasted about four months, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Uh, I'd been at this job for 15 years and uh, knew it's not where I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew where I was supposed to be. And so it just came to a head one day, and I walked away. Now, we did have, uh, we were primarily a wedding studio at the time. And I, I'd say we were doing 35 or 40 weddings a year. So I knew I wasn't going to starve. Yeah. Um, and then that just expanded and exploded into literally all types and all genres of photography. Uh, if the phone rang and someone said, can you do this? The answer was yes, no matter mm -hmm. what it was. Um, you know, we live in a rel relatively small town. And so, you know, you, you couldn't really, uh, at the time anyway, you couldn't specialize. But, uh, it, you know, it was a great time to be in business. I'm sure you remember that the phone rang, you know, if you were mm -hmm. a studio and if you were operating full time, your phone rang. Um, you didn't have to worry about, you know, the marketing aspect as much as you do today. Uh, so we were, we were busy, but uh, yeah, it was a huge leap of faith uh, for both of us to leave our jobs within a four month period uh, and, uh, and essentially jump into, you know, something completely unknown, but we, we just both knew where we were supposed to be. So, if so, the first thing I heard was you just had that gut feeling, and there was evidence that it was going well, and you had found a foundation with the weddings. Um, is there anything else when you think about what it took? Did it take courage? Did it take like, is there any advice you can give people who are? It took anger. <laughs> Ah, okay. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of information on that. So, you know, when I would take a vacation, for example, from my regular job, I'd spend the whole week working in the studio. And that's when I knew that's how I was able to tell this is absolutely where I'm supposed to be. And, uh, I, and in 1993, I bought the building that my studio was in and started doing remodeling to it. And I'd taken a couple of days off uh from my regular job so i could be there while they were doing critical things that needed decisions made and when i went back to work they um basically took me aside and slapped me on the wrist and said you know it's time to grow up and you know put away the the toys and mm. uh, and be an adult uh, i think i was 32 or 33 at the time uh and and you need to make a decision and i and i said you know you're right i do and i said i'm going to go clean out my locker and i went <laughs> off and i never looked back uh, so that i just got you know upset doing something that i didn't love and knowing where i was supposed to be so right. it took a little bit of anger interesting yeah i have a similar situation that got me going i was running a business in the airport um it had been given to me like a small business rather than me being the manager of it, uh, exchanging foreign currency and travel insurance. And I, I did really well, but then I was making some money just like you. I was like, oh, I can afford a good camera. And I, I started doing darkroom work and I, I started loving photography so much that I was distracted. And then if you remember the big recession in 1982, they wanted to cut my guarantee in half. This was Mitchell of Omaha. And of course I balked at that because I'd already bought a condo and I got used to making some good money and they canceled my contract. And she so said, out of necessity. yeah, she said, you know what, Lucy, you are going to see this as the best thing that's ever happened to you. And it was absolutely true. So it wasn't because of anger, but it was, you know, I was successful at one thing, but I got so focused on this passion. And then the world kept saying to me, you should be a photographer. And so at a certain point, I just said yes. And like you, weddings were the first and easiest way to start making a steady 
living. So yeah. I was in a big town, but low hanging oh, fruit. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. You know, um, it was good money. It was a lot of work. You know, as you know, yeah. it was not the most profitable thing you can do because of the amount of hours involved, but it had a huge potential for creativity. Um, it was just a cycle though. It was, you know, if you remember, I mean, I'm not sure how weddings were where you are, but uh, they were 12 to 14 hour affairs here. And they involved sometimes as many as four or five people uh, on my crew mm. and an entire van load of equipment front to back, everything from video projection equipment to video recording and photography backgrounds, lights. You know, we did all of that back in the 80s and 90s. Um, so, yeah, there was a lot involved in it. It was a lot of work. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, it was, like I said, it was a cycle because every Friday or every Saturday you'd go out and, and bust your butt and and, uh, and get this done. And at the end of the night, you were everybody's best friend. They loved you. Right? Yeah. They were like, as you're walking out the door telling you how great you were and, mm -hmm. you know, do you have a card and this and that. And then the next Friday night, because we always went to the rehearsal the night before, to sort of set the stage, we started from scratch. <laughs> right. And, and, and you were the enemy at that point, right? Because nobody mm -hmm. wanted to be told what to do. Exactly. Um, and so it was a fun thing, uh, but it, it does take its toll. And, and it I think that was probably the first thing that I let go. And it was pre-digital. So yes. the stress of waiting a week for me to see if I even got anything. Yes. <laughs> and... Yeah, being the enemy. One day I realized, oh, like just exactly what you just described. Every Saturday is an uh, I'm in a new job with new bosses, new coworkers. Mm -hmm. uh, it attracts people that like to be in charge. So negotiating around DJs and cake bakers and florists and coordinators. And oh, trying to there's, establish there's the word right there. That's the word coordinator still sends <laughs> chills up my spine because I never met one. Well, I take that back. Save one. Uh, there was one guy that I did enjoy working with. The rest of them were not coordinators. They were glorified decorators and mm. they really didn't care about anybody's job but their own. Right. Right. I Yes. So I think it might be easier now. I was great at candidates, but nobody would buy candidates. I would do them and then they would put all the posed pictures in and maybe a collection of candidates. But man, the training, architecture, uh, parties, portraiture, fashion, uh, so many things that we get to learn uh, while doing that. It's so, a great crash course, it is. Yeah, so when you switched and began to do something that was more time, like worth your time and money, you know, better time for a dollar exchange, what did you focus on? So we did keep point? doing weddings for a long time. I think I did them starting, my first one was in 1983, and I probably stopped around 2000. 11 or so so i did wow. it for quite a while but we reduced you know the numbers and changed how we did them but as we started to uh do that uh we filled that that void uh probably my favorite thing to shoot were high school seniors mm. uh, because you know they came in with a, a, a world of ideas and like you said fashion um they were fun and creative they took direction well uh they were profitable for the amount of time invested, they were, you know, one of the most profitable, probably second only to families. Mm -hmm. so we did families, we did children, and it was that whole cycle of life. You know, the weddings generated the children, which generated the families, which generated the seniors. Right. Uh, so we did literally everything, then got into commercial, um, uh, corporate headshots, uh, product photography. Uh, now I'm doing, you know, real estate and I'm, and I'm, I'm an FAA licensed drone pilot. So uh, literally anything that involved uh, creating an image, you know, we did. So if you were told, Mark, you have to pick one thing right now and you're guaranteed success at getting hyper-focused on one, uh, let's say you were going to move to a new community where you're not established. And so you decided to pick one thing, what would it be? So I will tell you that probably my passion 
right now is something that I have not been able to do for a couple of years. Uh, I got I spent about three years perfecting the technique that I wanted to uh, create in underwater photography. Mm. And I did quite a bit of it. Uh, most of it actually right here at home and in, in pool in the backyard. Mm -hmm. And then right about the time that it needed some major repairs, uh, COVID came along nice. and made it impossible mm -hmm. because there were, there was no, uh, there was, there were no materials available. Mm -hmm. And then a year later, when you could get the materials, there was nobody available to work on them because they were all backed up. So I have spent the last two years reconstructing and restoring the swimming pool uh, in the backyard so that I can do underwater photography again. I'm, I'm probably about three weeks away from putting a new liner in and mm. in water. So after two years, I'm almost back, back to it, but I absolutely love photographing underwater. Um, I like being in a controlled situation rather. I have shot in, uh, you know, springs and, uh, some, you know, some open water areas, but for the most part, I find that I, it, it suits my technique better to be in a controlled environment plus i hate being cold <laughs> hmm. so i can i can you know crank the temperature up and uh, and be nice and comfortable because these shoots will last you know two to three hours uh, right. typically uh, so, I, I don't like to be cold so are you doing underwater photography and making money at it or is this your semi-retirement creative passion or maybe both it's it's the the plan is for it to be both. So I I did not make a ton of money at it. I'll be, be honest. Uh, while I was, you know, creating this uh, this this opportunity and you know, like I said, perfecting the technique because I just needed to shoot and shoot and shoot mm -hmm. and get as much material and and play and work as much as possible until I was able to develop, you know, uh, a, a pattern that avoided all of the problems and gave me the results that I wanted. Um, and so, yeah, I would love now that this is, you know, next season we'll be back in operation. Uh, I would love to start to market that. And, and honestly, that alone, if I did nothing but that, mm -hmm. uh, I can only work for three months out of the year here, but that doesn't mean I can't travel, you know, Florida, California, Texas, if we can, you know, find a way to, to garner clients in those areas, travel and work in their, in their locations, uh, there's no reason why you know, why we can't do that. There's just no reason. Who are you picturing as your clients and what thoughts do you have about marketing to them? So I think, I don't want to, I don't, hopefully I don't come across as sexist when I say this, but um, what I've seen so far is that in, in almost any kind of um, photography and underwater, certainly no exception, I see a lot of, um, maybe early middle-aged women who um i don't know i'm not sure quite how to put it but i think they're looking for something different something mm -hmm. unusual it's very difficult for anyone i think to to take a portrait of themselves and feel good about hanging it on the wall because first of all we're also critical of ourselves right second of all it feels a little bit narcissistic but if you have something that is an actual art piece and something that people will just look at and go, my God, how did they, how did you create that? Um, then I think you've got a market for, uh, for, for people wanting to put something like that on their walls. And obviously that is the, the goal is to, um, you know, it's not unusual for me to do a three hour session and come away with two images that I really, mm -hmm. really like. Uh, so wall portraits are definitely the way to go. So it sounds like you might be approaching it like you would boudoir. A little bit, yeah. Uh, wet boudoir. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wet <laughs> <your breath. laughs> So, yeah, it's funny. The, the technique involves, um, I, I do a lot of, I have a whole arsenal of fabrics that I work with underwater that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're never really sure what's going to flow well underwater until you mm -hmm. test it. So I have all sorts of things, uh, some of which just work great underwater, either with in conjunction with, uh, you know, a flowing dress or something like that, or with nothing at all. Um, we do, we have a lot of, uh, of women who like to, you know, just have that it's a very freeing feeling, I think. Uh, but yet you've got the the comfort of some type of material that's going to flow around you and, and hide things that you don't want to be seeing. Uh, right. And yeah, it's, it's a, 
it's a lot of fun because you you can't you can plan it but you can't really uh have a, a total concept in mind because every dive every single time you go underwater you're going to get a completely different result mm -hmm. even with the same model the same fabric and whatever uh, i um I'm part of a women's photography group in San Diego that um, we started it in the 80s when I'm sure you would acknowledge it was pretty much a man's world <laughs> up until maybe late 90s. And so we started this group to support each other um, so that we could figure out answers to questions like, what do you wear to a wedding? Or uh, I don't know, all the sharing and caring that women can do. <laughs> And then once it shifted culturally, we turned it into a creative group to keep the spark alive and to do things that, you know, when you're really in the trenches, working, working, working at a photography business, you don't always take the time to go do things. And just last month, we did an underwater shoot and um, it was so fun. And yes, I got maybe five images out of hundreds and hundreds and they were nothing like I thought I was even getting. Exactly. Exactly. They typically are vastly different than what you might've had in mind. But if you can get those five, even if they're not what you had in mind, they're, they're going to be awesome. Yeah. They're, they're really going to be great. And I have an image, um, cause we've done this a couple other times. Uh, it wasn't my turn to be in the pool, <laughs> Uh, going back a few years, but there was this great model that I did some things from the shore and she was able to lay flat and then let herself sink without, you know, feeling drowned. And I got this incredible image where it looked like her hand was, was a sword and it, I call it lady of the lake. And it was just one of those like, oh my gosh, everything came together. So yeah, I can see how that could work. Do you have a like a couple of thoughts about how you might start marketing that? Um, I think, you know, I think honestly, this is the type of thing. And again, this is what I've seen on a smaller scale here is that it's going to start with one or two people uh, who will then spread that. This is because this is something, you know, a lot of a lot of people, um, families, women, whatever, uh, they, you know, they tend to be very protective and um, uh, they don't necessarily want to refer someone who might create something that's similar to what they have. Mm -hmm. But in this case, every single image is so vastly different that I think that the word of mouth will start that snowball running. Someone will, will say, my God, you need to do this. This was so much fun. And that's what I hear after every single session. Mm -hmm. This was so much fun. Uh, that they can pass that along. And, and I really do believe that um, this is one of the few areas that I think that snowball will almost roll on its own. If you can get two or three people at the at the base that are really good, uh, who have a good influence of people around them, and then that just spread that. Uh, obviously, you know, to, to work in other areas, to work in other parts of the country, uh, they'll, I'll need to, you know, have some type of a uh, a large online presence with this type of work mm -hmm. where people can go and view and see uh, and, and an FAQ, of, you know, what they can expect and all of that. You pretty much have all the questions answered. We're in that age where people, they want to have all that information at their fingertips before they make a decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they like to do their research. So a really, really good website that is going to answer all the questions and cross all the T's. Uh, and then just simply getting that link out to the right people uh, and in the right right areas and the right income brackets. Right. Uh, I don't think it'll take, I really don't think it'll take much because it is such a unique thing. Right. And I don't think there are many people that are, there, there are, are a lot of people doing magnificent underwater photography. I don't think a lot of them are selling it. I think it's mostly models. So I definitely can see how there could be an opening for. There are a couple. Yeah, there's a couple 
people who I, I know Christy uh, Elias Sutton is doing some amazing underwater work. Mm -hmm. um, I love what she does. I also love the fact that it's completely different from what I do. Uh, <laughs> and I think I've seen that. I know Larry Peters in Columbus started doing it a few years back. Uh, and it's the same thing. He really focused more on underwater portraiture uh, because that's kind of his thing. Um, so I haven't seen anybody that has the style that I do, which mm -hmm. you know, as much as I love some of the other ones, I love the fact that nobody else is is doing what I'm doing. Right, right. Um, so I think that alone helps things stand stand out. And if somebody starts doing what I'm doing and can find a way to duplicate it, well, guess what? Then I'll just start doing something else. <laughs> well, and the thing is, okay, I have two things. So Christy, she's a California gal. Mm -hmm. And her work from the start has always been unusual and magical and magical that's a great word spooky and like one year if you could win every single award at our professional you know ppc like best in any category that she entered and she got kodak awards and she got best in show like she's christy elias sutton if someone wants to look her up she said she's going to be on my show i haven't been able to pin her down um, be a great one. so she's already got marketing for something that's not your usual let's get a family on the beach and make a triangle which is very <laughs> sellable <laughs> yep. um and I, I was thinking about how um maybe you had the same experience uh in your community but when i was starting people were not buying wall portraits of families that much it and then Charles Lewis came through and um, um, Ken Whitmire and other people were teaching us. Do you, you remember that? Oh era? my God, yes. Yeah, and yes. what happened was the more people in my community that started focusing on wall portraits, the more business there was for everybody because someone would go in a home, see a beautiful portrait over the fireplace and want that and then start looking for a photographer. They didn't only go to, you know, that studio. And so there became a market for that. And so I think your your idea of, you know, let's do this beyond the creative fun art play, let's make it a viable, profitable business. We'll just open it up for everybody. And I'll be honest, if if, if the marketing falls flat, I will still do it because it is, it is the best creative outlet that I've ever had mm -hmm. uh, in any area of photography. Uh, you know, one of the programs, it's funny, I said something about, you know, I knew where I was supposed to be. One of the programs that I presented is actually called Where Are You Supposed to Be? Mm. Um, and, you know, I just lost my train of thought there, but I'll come back in a second. Uh, but it has it had to do with... Um, you know, the fact that, uh, I don't know what it was, there, there are two types of photography uh, in the presentation and they're, they're titled what pays the bills and the other half is what feeds the soul. Mm. And I think you need, you know, you need to have, most people need to have both. Uh, I'm at a point in my life and in my career now where, you know, I've paid the bills. Mm -hmm. I really need to feed my soul. Right. Um, and so I paying the bills if it comes out of that is going to be a great side benefit. Uh, but my primary focus on it is going to be feeding my soul because that's just where I'm at in my life. Yeah. So that was one of the, the questions that I had in mind. Um, I'm asking you different things than I normally ask people because you have this 40 years of experience and you're in the transition retirement, semi-retirement is so this one is a, a, okay, I'll ask this one first. So what's your plan? Like, are you planning to at some point fully retire or what are your thoughts? How are you set up for that? We, we had, we had a local photographer for years who passed away a couple of years ago, master photographer. And Who's I used that? to love uh, his name was Dick Cress, and I used to love the way he put it. He'd say, 
I'll never completely retire until I go to the big dark room in the sky. Mm. <laughs> and and I think as long as I'm able to, I will always feel the need to create something. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, making money at it is great uh, as well. You know, I just just shot a couple of things in the last two weeks that uh, are a little, we're a little more, um, well, let's just say a little less creative, uh -huh. uh, you know. A more commercial, like it, sellable. Yeah, you know, headshots for the state gubernatorial or state uh, Republican Party, uh, you know, things like that that are bang, bang, you know, a couple of hours and you're done and, and generates a nice paycheck. Uh, those are those are fun to do because of that, but they certainly don't do anything to, to you know, feed your creativity. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I just feel like I'm never going to completely quit. Yeah. Uh, and that need to create has always been there. It will always be there. Uh, I'm lucky that my uh, my girlfriend, who uh, she lives about an hour away from me, so I only see her on weekends. Um, she has that same creative drive that nice. I do in a different way. Um, and it was it was great the first time that I took her to Imaging USA because I, it, she was like a kid in a candy store. And seeing so much work that was on display from so many talented and creative people just blew her away. And it just sparked all of these ideas. And uh, she started coming to me with with thoughts and ideas that she probably uh, would have kept to herself otherwise and, until mm -hmm. she realized, hey, it's a, this is a safe environment to throw this out here. And so where that led is that she is now, uh, she is a license, she has a trademarked, uh, nationally trademarked mermaid. Uh, mm -hmm. Mermaiding is something that she always wanted to do, not in a performance uh, arena, but in a humanitarian one. Uh, she is a breast cancer warrior. She has uh, uh, a metastatic breast cancer. And instead of doing what I would do, which is curl up in a ball and, you know, wait for whatever, she's decided um, that she wants to, to spend her time and her talents helping people who don't have the same access to the resources that she does. Mm. And so she created this character. Her tagline, by the way, is protect your seashells. Um, <laughs> because it's breast cancer <laughs> and um i get to create her content for all of the ad campaigns that she does uh she's involved in fundraising for uh, a number of um well one uh a regional hospital a women's hospital as well as the susan g Komen foundation which is a national mm -hmm. uh, cancer research foundation um and talk about something that is snowballed uh, you know because it is again unusual and unique Right. Uh, it is a it's a constant source of, uh, you know, I need I need images for this or, or images for that or there's an event here and we're going to go and uh, maybe we photograph it and maybe we just go as guests or whatever. But uh, it's a it's a it's a fun thing to do, even though it's surrounded by, you know, something which is kind of dark and gloomy. Um, her idea has always been that when you look at any marketing that's done in the breast cancer arena or cancer in general, it's always showing you somebody who is literally with one foot in the grave because mm -hmm. the target market and the idea is we need to generate funds and we need to make money. Yeah. So yeah. we're not going to do that by showing people that are healthy and fun, but she wants to create imagery for the women who are going through this and don't want to see those kinds of images. They want hope. They want to right. realize that it's not a death sentence, that you can still uh you know achieve whatever you want she's currently uh, part of a dragon boat team uh and does dragon boat racing oh. uh, along with the, a whole boat full of breast cancer warriors so it's a really cool thing to see literal boat full so what i'm hoping this is sparking for people is for them to think about what kinds of things they love to do that can contribute to others um, one of the things I'm the most proud of is I worked with San Diego County Adoption and photographed kids that were ready for forever homes and I'll, you know, volunteer. So my question for you is in this 40 year career, what's something that you're the most proud of? Oh, wow. Um, well, what I just mentioned to you, I think, is probably number one on the list. It, it, it's mm -hmm. I'm so happy uh, to be able to take part in that and to participate in something that's so worthwhile. But you kind of hit on something there a minute ago that I want to I want to emphasize a little bit for anybody 
uh, and not using it as a marketing idea, but it's a, it's a roundabout way to get there. But anybody who is passionate about any thing you can do to help other people get involved in that and work through that, because it's not just rewarding in and of itself. It does lead to work. You know, it all, it right. opens so many doors. Um, like I said, it's, it's not the way you look at it. You don't go into it thinking, well, I'm going to do this because I'll get business out of it. No, uh, you do it because you love it and because it helps someone. Uh, but because of that, uh, business does come through over right. the years we've done uh, children, you know, children's promotions or money was donated to, you know, uh, toy, uh, you know, toys for top type type things. And, um, geez, I can't even remember now. Uh, it seemed like one led into another and, and they were all becoming a blur <laughs> after yeah. so many years, but I don't think there was ever a time, uh, when we weren't actively involved in some type of fundraising or charity, right. um, just because, you know, we're part of the community and, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's what you should do. That's what everybody right. should do. It's the right yeah. thing to do. One of the things, thank you for that, Mark. Um, one of the things that happened after I did, uh, it, we did calendars two years in a row and each month was a different child or sibling group and they partnered with churches. So I photographed the child with the pastor of each of those churches now I'm a preacher's kid, so pretty clear that this was supposed to be my assignment. Uh, but what what happened was I was freed to photograph the way that I was inspired with these kids. My job was to, in a non-financially well w way, sell the kids. And so I didn't have like in my mind, is someone going to buy these? And it dislodged something in me in a good way that then my work from that point on changed and was better because I'd been kind of gotten into the PPA style rut. You know what I mean by that? Uh, especially the before digital where the level of creativity just exploded insanely and <laughs> and things like that so I don't think there's the same like here's what makes a sellable image quite as strongly but anyway so yeah things and also then I had my best client ever call me out of the blue and I think it was the universe or whatever is out there thanking me <laughs> for doing that work on the planet so yeah we never know is the moral of the story we never know one thing leads to another no never and never judge a book by its cover um you know I, i'm sure that you would agree that over the years uh the people that drive up to the front of the studio in you know the mercedes or the lexus or whatever not necessarily uh going to be the ones that are going to be the easiest to sell it's the mm -hmm. ones that you don't expect it from and the reason is because it means something to them it has right. value to them um, they're much more connected through their heart to family and, and things like that and whatever it takes they will find a way if whatever it costs they will find a way to pay it right uh, and and that's you know I, I i'll always i'll always be you know looking for a way to help somebody like that uh, afford what it is that they really want um, because I, I just know you know it's not going to just you know, go sit on a shelf somewhere and and be another purchase it's going to be something that they'll view and look at every single day right right and when we are at the golden the sweet light part of our careers <laughs> which I think we're kind of in that I I had this whole plan to start a um a, like a not a rest home, but a retirement community of photographers. And we'd, we'd have room, we'd have meeting rooms so we could teach. We'd have dark rooms. I invented a, a walker, not really, but a, a, a combo tripod walker. <laughs> and I was going to call this sweet light retirement community. <laughs> well, just don't ever hire a DJ that'll come in and play the Macarena and YMCA because you'll kill us all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. So there's, there'll be the, when, when it's someone's time to go, there's a special room. <laughs> anyway, 
I just, I just digress on that. Um, oh, well, so why did I say, so when we're in the sweet light of our career, I forget my point on that, but anyway. It happens, it happens often to me. Yes. <laughs> um, so who were you most influenced by in your early years? Oh, wow. There's the list is huge. Um, I mean, I remember I go back as far as people like Donald Jack, Monty Sucker, uh, who actually even came along after, you know, Donald Jack. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Charles Lewis, um, uh, you know, more. And he's recently. still out there teaching. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned uh, also Larry Peters, who probably when mm -hmm. I was doing senior photography was one of the biggest influences in that. Um, I mentioned a name to you uh, that I'm sure you've heard, John Hartman. Uh, yeah. John was, he was one of the first week-long classes that I actually took, and it was on desktop publishing. This is a guy who's reinvented <laughs> his career over and over yeah. again um, and is now doing amazing things. I, I actually took his light painting class a couple of years ago, uh, and I actually convinced him uh, he's going to create one of my presidential portraits for me. Yeah, uh, I had the idea that I wanted certain photographers who's who's either whose work I really admire or who had an impact on my career uh, to awesome. to create those photos, and he's agreed to do one for me. We have to set up the details yet, but yeah, he's another one that I just love. Uh, his work is excellent, and he's not stuck in one rut. Right, uh, he's continually evolved and. And doing all sorts of different things and doing each one of them amazingly. So, but mm -hmm. man, I know there's a huge list of people. Joseph, yeah. Joseph and Luis uh, Simone mm -hmm. from Canada. Oh my God, yeah. just amazing work. Amazing. Yeah. So John Hartman has been on my show. So oh, if right. people are like, "Huh, I want to know more about him," just page back maybe a year ago or so, and uh, you'll you'll be able to find him and how I want, I don't pick people's brains. I wander around and see what I find in there. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, yeah, he's so, such a great guy. So, and the reason I asked that is just so that people listening will understand that a 40 year career did not happen from sitting at home in our houses online, hoping and praying someone will find us. Like we were out there especially active in the professional photographers of America, in our local or state chapters, so much education available. Um, and then the camaraderie. I I have like, probably if I look at your friends on Facebook and my friends, we probably have 150 mutual friends. I'm sure. And these are people we're, we actually know and are on hugging basis or can call for help. So so you, know, you, is... you bring up you bring up a really good point. You know, PPA's got probably one of the most extensive uh, online uh, learning tools in PPA EDU. Um, so much great information on there. But uh, as great as it is, there is no um, you can't hold a candle to that face to face. Um, and you mentioned the word camaraderie. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, a lot of the, the state, local and regional affiliates are really struggling because they've, they've lost sight of the fact that that is their strength. They can actually get together face to face and do all the things that you've talked about, uh, answer questions, uh, you know, what problems have you had, uh, be there for support if someone needs help, uh, which you can't do, you know, realistically on a national level, but on a much smaller local and, and state, man, that's, uh, I can't tell you not only how much information I, I gathered that way, um, but what a what a cr an incredible network of colleagues and friends over the years that I would oh, never yeah. have had otherwise. Yeah. So is there um, is there one piece of advice that someone gave you that made a huge difference early on in your career? And I've got one I wanted to share. So that's why I'm asking the question so I can self selfishly so share mine. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I think I think what comes to mind it did not come from a photographer. Uh, I was uh, we were photographing a uh, university commencement, and we did this job every year. And uh, you know sometimes they had really interesting commencement speakers, but 
you know, my focus was on, we were doing video and still photography and everything else. And sometimes closed, closed circuit in another room and recording. And it, there was just a lot going on. So I didn't always pay attention uh, to anything other than my job. But this one day, uh, there were these two gentlemen, older gentlemen, uh, they were brothers. And they had podiums on either side of the stage. And it was sort of like a point counterpoint situation. They both managed five star resorts in different parts of the world, different companies entirely, but they did the same jobs. And I remember, you know, because at a commencement, the commencement speaker's words typically go in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. And you're never going to remember what anyone said. But this guy said something that was so poignant and made so much sense to me. He looked at the graduates and he said, you know, I, I don't know how old he was at the time, 70, maybe 75. And he said, if you wake up one morning and you're 35 years old and you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, change it. It is never too late. I've got gravy stains on my tie that is that are older than that. There is nothing that that is rooting you in whatever you are doing or wherever you are. Uh, if you feel that you need to be doing something else and be somewhere else, do it. And we live in a country that allows that to happen. Right. Not not every country does, uh, but we do. And there's no excuse. Uh, I mean, there are excuses, obviously, if you have obligations to fulfill and so forth. But there are there's always a way. If you yeah. feel that you need to do something, do it. And, and I never forgot that. Um, and do it do it now because um, nothing is guaranteed. There's no promise of tomorrow. And I've seen way too many people put things off and never get there mm -hmm. because the unexpected happens. Right. Um, so yeah, the advice given to me was change if you need to, and the advice I'll give out to anyone else is change it now if you need to. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I've reinvented my career now three times because wedding photography for 12 years and then kids and which evolved into families and then now coaching and podcast and it, it, it keeps life interesting. And then it also gives me more to learn. So my, my, this was, this was one of those not as profound, but really practical and it was during lunch at a photography two-day seminar our photo lab used to give and somebody who's just a little bit more ahead of me uh in the business maybe five years local guy we were talking about pricing and he said the way to get to the pricing you want is start out at a place where it, it's reasonable, you can make profit on it. And then when you're as busy as you want to be, go up 10 to 20%. And then you'll have more time, but you'll make the same money. And then get busy marketing, improve your work. And then you'll get busy again and just keep rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And, uh, you know, you can't start out at $200 and do that because it'll be 20 years before you're making you know, I don't know, thousand, but, um, that, that's how I got to the top of the food chain in weddings and same with portraits, not, not as, not the same, ah, but, but practical. And uh, if I can piggyback on that, cause I love that, that thought, um, what I used to tell people, which I think made them, you know, jump back a little bit and say, what, uh, you should not, in my opinion, this is everything I'm saying is my opinion, obviously. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be able to afford yourself. Right. If if you can afford, if you're setting your pricing based on what you would pay or what you can't afford, your income will never grow. You need right. to be charging more than what you can afford to pay if you want your income to grow. That was one thing. And then the second part of that, and again, you you brought this thought to my head. Uh, I remember years ago after doing weddings for about 10, 10 years. So this would have been what early nineties. We were probably, our average was around $2,000 for a wedding in the early nineties. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, what would happen if I doubled my prices? Mm -hmm. What if I, what if I doubled and I tried to get a $4,000 average? Well, I thought, well, the first thing that'll happen is I'll lose half my clients. But then I took a pencil and a piece of paper and I figured out that 20 weddings at 2000 or I'm sorry, 40 weddings at $2,000 is $80,000. 
20 weddings at $4,000 is $80,000. But I have 20 free weekends to pursue other things, other types of work, 20 mm -hmm. less brides I have to deal with. <laughs> and the amount of time that I would put back in my pocket was just amazing. So uh, that's literally what we did. Uh, and, it, and it worked exactly the way we wanted to. And it's funny when your pricing goes up, this is another thing for people to consider when your pricing goes up, you tend to have fewer problems because the people yes. who like the nickel and dime you are the ones that will trickle away when that happens. Right, right. I've pondered, why is that, that you get more complaints? And then I was thinking about, I'm searching for a house painter and there's a neighbor who would charge $8,000 when everyone else is charging $25,000. Would I trust him or would I watch everything he did? Because why is he so cheap? You know, so it's that level of trust. The more that they invest with us, the more they'll be hands off because they trust us as professionals. And, so and the word invest, I love. That was something that we used a lot. And, and whenever we had somebody who was, uh, you know, a little bit hesitant to, to push through and actually sign the check for whatever the amount was, you know, we explained to them that this is an investment and you make this investment one time. And what I mean by that is in five years, if your house burns down or your dog eats your portrait or whatever, you bought, you bought it and you will only buy it one time, whatever the reason we will replace it no matter what. And mm -hmm. that was amazing how that calmed people's fears and made them realize that, you know, they don't have to put it up on the wall and, and worry about it every day. Like, don't touch it. Don't go near it. They bought it. They own it, and and we would. And I think in forty years we replaced two portraits uh, due to homes burning down. Well, and I love the it has to be the reality that you kept negatives and you kept it, your digital files safe and sound. Or you we can't. did we yeah. did until um, the early two thousands when my studio was hit with a massive flood while I was teaching uh -huh. in North Carolina and got back and all of our almost all of our negatives the things that were still in production were upstairs but everything that was in storage in the basement was gone you know so oh, that's heartbreaking yeah, but now was. i'm sure you keep your digital files yeah and they're so much smaller aren't they <laughs> <laughs> it, okay. it it seems like it but there's so many more of them i think uh, and that's, that's why true. it seems a little more daunting but yeah everything's backed up multiple times yeah finding them later that's always for me a little bit of a challenge yeah we so, had a good catalog system so i think we're in good shape there so i'm super excited that you're going to be president and i get to say i know the president <laughs> now. <laughs> and i also love that you wore red and i wore blue so we're nice color <laughs> combo i was born on the fourth of july so red and blue awesome. are my, my superpower and you've got a white wall behind you and i've That's got a right. white guitar so we've got the whole red white and blue thing going on i had a lot of red white and blue birthday cakes and and bathing suits and things as a kid awesome. um so you're coming into your presidency in march of next year so soon do you have a goal or a vision like the number one thing that you would love at the end of your year to be like, wow, I really made that happen with my team. So the the general thought that all of us have on the board, and I think everybody, and I think Mary Fisk Taylor was the first one that I heard actually vocalize this, uh, is to say, leave it better than you found it. Right. Uh, and so that would be part one and part two, something if I could make a little more personal um, I would love to, uh, I would love to make photography viable again. And what I mean by that is back when you and I started, um, and I mentioned that the phone rang no matter what, that's not the case today. And, uh, and a lot of photographers are struggling to make that happen. I would love to, uh, create an environment where not only is photography a viable, uh, and it is, it can be, there are a lot of people out there that are killing it right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to see that happen on, on the scale that we had it back in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. uh, so that it is viable and that it is a respected profession again. Because what's happened with society is we've become a commodity and everybody says, well, why would you spend that kind of money on that? Anybody can do that with a cell phone. I want them to understand what they cannot do with a cell phone. 
So do you have some plans for, because that's a big, uh, you know, for a year as president. <laughs> yeah, this is more of a long, a long term goal, like but it all comes from education. It all comes from, um, you know, just getting the information out there to let people know what it is that they know, what it is they need to know uh, in order for that to happen. I'll tell you one of the best people to talk to along those lines, if you haven't already, uh, he's our industry advisor on the board, Ronan Ryle from yeah. Ireland. He's been on my show. Man, amazing, amazing guy. Yes. Oh uh, and gosh. he and I, we think a lot alike along those lines where, uh, hey, competition is great and and it's fun and all of that. And there's a lot of things that are fun. But bottom line is, who wants to be a starving artist? Uh, right. And so that's that's what I'd like to see kind of go away a little bit is a starving yeah. artist idea. Yeah. Um, this something that was really awesome that I don't think we do anymore is there was a charitable competition where we would submit, you know, we would do something as a nonprofit and I won uh, with the calendar that I did for San Diego County adoption. I won a thousand bucks from PPA and got the, the top printed thing. And that, if I were, if I were in your position, that might be something that I would bring back is is yeah, it's, submitting it's, it's, projects, printed things, things they've done to serve. I know right now, uh, Rich and his team have have quite a bit on their plate trying to get the new IPC up and running and still keeping the MIR you know flowing smoothly. But down the road, those are great ideas. Uh, and you know, it's funny our this PPA staff is so good uh, that so many times we'll come to them with an idea and say, "Hey, have you guys thought about that?" And they're like started on that six months ago you know so, <laughs> so they, they probably are really, already are doing yeah, that <laughs> you know because they live it it's their job day in and day out we right. get together quarterly and we've got all these ideas and then we find out wow they've been working on this for a while already so yeah it, it's amazing I, i'll have a conversation with rich about that and, and see what he has to say yeah it was so like 19 so 2000 right around there is when for about three years they had um, I don't know if I have. Yeah, it was the Annie Award. Oh yeah, I remember those. I happen yeah. to have. Yep, for yeah. Anne Monteith. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. another name I should have mentioned when you asked. And she's Anne been Rose. on my show too, so all yeah, the cool kids. So it's about time I reached out to you, Mark. Is all our. <laughs> all our yeah, I think go check our friends list. I think you might find more than 150. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Which I my hope for everyone listening is that they. If, if they're newer, that they could have the feeling, the satisfaction, the camaraderie, the friendship, the education, everything that you and I have gotten to have by being in this same community, you know, learning, sharing, giving, uh, you know, it, it's not all like people be like, oh, I joined and oh, I didn't get anything out of it. And you say, well, did you go to conferences? Did, what did you put into it? Did you reach towards being a master photographer how did you get involved so and so i'll i'll say that as an invitation to anybody listening um don't feel shy or bashful at all you know i I've, I've been around since dirt but that doesn't mean you know i'm i'm no different than anybody else and i'm more than willing to to help anybody reach out you know uh either as a just another photographer or as you know ppa uh, board member or whatever i'm i'm more than willing to try to help somebody uh, who's struggling get get to where they need to be. Which is the spirit of our industry that's been passed on to us from absolutely those, those uh, mentors that you mentioned, many of them who are not with us anymore, but they gave and gave. And so, yeah, think about how you can give. So how would someone get in touch with you if they have a question? Um, so... You can, first of all, my PPA email address is is printed every month in the magazine. It's in the front, uh, one of the front pages of the magazine, uh, but it's just mcampbell at ppa.com. Uh, my studio address uh, is mark at prestigephoto.net. Uh, so that's another way to, to go directly to me. Um, probably email is the, is the quickest way you're going to get a response because I, I'm, I'm on my email pretty much constantly unless I'm 
unless I'm grinding concrete in the pool in the backyard, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm checking it frequently. So i uh, be more than happy to help. Wonderful. And so I'd love to have you either, if there's something you, you would feel like, oh, I wish I'd have mentioned this, or uh, a, a parting thought you want to leave us with. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for you. So what do you got for me? Well, I don't know what I'll think of later. Um, yeah. you know, hopefully there there isn't too much. Hopefully we've left it all out on the table here. Um, but I, I think really what it what it comes down to for me, and I think to wrap up everything I've been talking about is to just follow your passion. Mm. Um, and that means if your passion doesn't seem like something that will pay the bills, just think about it. If you really put your mind to it, um, you may find a way. I, I remember, uh, just tell you a little personal story to finish it up. We used to go on a family vacation every year uh, to the Outer Banks. And the last year we went, we had eight children under the age of eight. Yeah. Uh, so it was like living in a bowling alley for a week. And and when we got back, I said, that's it. I'm done. We're not, I'm not doing that again. We didn't have children. Uh, love, love the nieces and nephews, but that was a little bit much. And so I was floating around in the pool one day and I thought, boy, I'm going to miss that vacation. I'm going to miss that area. And then I started thinking about, it. well, is there a way that I could go back there um, and stay someplace really, really nice, uh, but make it affordable? And that's, we started something called Mentor Island Workshops, where we, we actually rented a, uh, a 10 bedroom, 12 bathroom house on the beach with an in-ground pool and a bar and everything, elevator, the whole nine yards. And we uh, we had six instructors. Everyone was uh, in a different genre, a different area of expertise. And we charged people to come and not just participate in learning, but to actually live with us for a week. So the questions never stopped, whether you were laying by the pool or out on the beach or whatever. Uh, in addition to the formal stuff that we did, we were available 24-7 uh, to help people along. And so there's always a way. If you want something bad enough, you will find a way, but put your mind to it. Uh, get rid of all the negative thoughts. Uh, don't tell yourself it won't work or it won't work in my area. There is a way to make it work. You just have to figure it out. Right. And I'm thinking about um, when I was feeling kind of passionless, I spent a week with Arthur Rainville. When I was feeling like, holy cow, the world has changed. I got to figure out how to keep making money at this. I went to a week long workshop at Ken Whitmire's um, where we did exactly what you're talking about. There were several teachers. He had his core curriculum. We had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. Uh, and I came back on fire. And so, yeah, don't just sit there. <laughs> yeah, get out there. It's it's out there waiting. There's a world waiting for you out there. Just get to it. That's right. So um, before I say goodbye to the fabulous Mark Campbell, Vice President of PPA Board, <laughs> uh, remember to stay tuned for my quick wrap up. And Mark, I'm so glad I had this idea of why don't I see who's on the PPA Board I haven't talked to yet uh, on the podcast and really, really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you so, so much. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad you reached out and uh, I hope someone finds a little nugget of information in there somewhere that uh, is helpful to them. All right. Talk to you in a minute, everyone. Well, Mark and I had a nice chat after we had this nice chat that you're going to get to hear. Um, and then the light significantly changed because it's late afternoon. So you see that sweet light <laughs> in the back. Let me see if I can do a quick wrap up. Um, normally, I don't get into somebody's history, but when someone has had a career like he's had for 40 years, I love digging into what it takes. And I think you can hear that it took commitment, education for him being in a small town, specializing in one thing was not what worked for him, but he specialized in everything. Um, we talked about underwater photography and some ideas of how to market that. 
which is super fun. And I love that he said we should not be able to afford ourselves. I think ponder that. And if you get to the point where you can afford yourself, then raise it even after 40 years. Um, you know, I certainly could afford myself as a photographer, which tells me maybe I need to double <laughs> what I'm charging so that I wouldn't be comfortable uh, paying for myself again. Anyhow, hope I'm not babbling too much. I think some of the core is just getting involved in this profession, not just a great big PPA advertisement and our local chapters, but wherever you are in the world, 95 countries and counting, connect with others, make friends, grow together. So that's it for now. And thank you for sending me an email or a comment on the podcast or YouTube, just letting me know that you're listening and maybe one quick thing that you appreciate or what you're getting out of it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and that's it. Big hug from San Diego. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one -on -one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.